Hey guys, welcome to the Shift with Intention podcast. I'm Jamie Zagrafis, your host. And today I just wanted to pop on. I I had a special visitor this weekend, my daughter, and it was a little surprise. And so my weekend it got a little bit jobbled up. And so the interview I was going to have today, we had to reschedule for next week. So with that said, I just felt like it was a good time for me to pop on because today I had a special day. And that is that I got a little certificate, Jamie Zagrapis, for graduating from the therapist that I've been seeing for the last couple of years, who's been one of the wisest people in my life. And I've learned so much from her. And I just wanted to share some of the bits of wisdom that have really, really helped me and what I've learned from her. And then a couple other people that I've seen in my life through my journey. So a lot of people, we all could sit on a couch and talk to a therapist about anything. And there's sometimes I feel like there's some shame around seeing a therapist or people feel like, you know, there's something wrong with me or whatever. But at the end of the day, we all have stuff going on. We all can improve ourselves and we all can get, you know, someone else who isn't emotionally attached to our situation to help us get through something. I'm huge on therapists. I think they are such a integral part of our personal development and finding a good one is so amazing. And so I was referred to mine about, I don't know, COVID, like June of 20, but I did not start seeing her until uh, July of 21. So I guess it's about a year and a half that I've been seeing her, not quite two years. Anyway, so I just wanted to share some of the really, really neat things that I've learned that maybe you can learn and it can help you. So I'm going to end with my current therapist that I just graduated from. And but before that, I have a couple little um, pieces of information that I learned along the way from other wonderful people that I mentors or therapists that I have met in my life. And one was this older gentleman that was a therapist of mine while I was going through my cancer journey. And there was a situation that I was going through that I could not seem to make a decision on. And it was my second marriage. So this was in complete vulnerability. And I just, you know, was going through the cancer journey. I, things were so hard and I couldn't make a decision on whether I wanted to stay married. And at one point I'm talking, talking, talking in the session. And he said, Hey, just stop for a second. What would you tell your daughters if this was them? What would you say? And I said, I would tell them they got to go. And he goes, so why is it okay for you, but it's not okay for them to stay? And I was like, huh. And, and that really, really hit me. Cause I was like, you know, sometimes we, we choose things for ourselves that we would never choose for our children. And our children are typically the ones that we love the most and unconditionally. And you don't want your children to go through some of the things that you went through. So at that point, I was like, huh, good point. And so I had ended that and whatnot. But it really, it's made me think from, you know, from that point forward on other things that I do, I'm like, gosh, what would I say if this was my kids come to me, whether it's about, you know, an employee or a job or a friend, any, anything, you know, we all are experiencing different relationships. And so I just, I thought that was really neat and I've utilized it several times. So that was one little piece of wisdom from that therapist. Then I went on this marriage seminar before I got married to the one that I was getting divorced from. But anyway, um, and we decided to go to this um, encounter weekend or whatnot, even though we weren't married, but all the other couples were. And there was like eight other couples. It was one of the neatest experiences. And one of the days we had walked in late, like 20, 30 minutes late to the um, gathering that day. And the facilitator pulled us aside and he's like, Hey guys, um, is everything okay? And I was like, "Mm -mm." and my husband was like, Oh yeah. And so he's like, why don't you guys come over here? So we went in the back room and 
He's like, so what's going on? So I say my side and husband says his side. And then he looks at me and he goes, Jamie, this is your stuff. And I was like, okay, so now what do we do? And so the neatest thing is he said, let me teach you something or share something, whatever. He said, when we have a reaction that is bigger than what a normal reaction to that problem would be, that means it's our stuff. And that was in 2012. I learned that. So now we're in 2023 and I've utilized that so much and shared that with people close to me. And so like, let's say, you know, your kid decides that he's going to cancel on an event with a grandparent or something. And this wasn't the situation, but this is, you know, a situation of somebody I was helping. And, and that person was like, are you kidding me? You can't do that. And, and kind of overreacting, um, to the situation at hand. And so that means that that's their trigger or their stuff to heal. And so it's been so really enlightening and in, you know, introspective for me, if I feel like, Hey, that's a, that's a bit much, Jamie, <laughs> of a reaction to something, then that's our stuff that we have to look at. And so that's really helped me. You know, if I feel a lot of emotion around something that's going on, I'm like, yep, yeah, this is my stuff. This gets, I get the opportunity to heal something now because it's presented itself. So again, that little nugget of wisdom is, if your reaction to a situation is bigger than a normal reaction, then it's usually your stuff to heal. So keep that in mind. That was really, really neat. Okay. So those were two little pieces of information from therapists that I learned from, you know, probably somewhere between 2012, 2015. So then I meet this new incredible therapist and the other two were male and I have always had ma male or female but I've never liked one more than the other. I, I feel like the therapist at each time were both, were all wonderful for me. So, um, nonetheless, so my current therapist, the first thing she taught me was a value system. Like we all have a value system. We went through, it was a really neat thing. We went through like 125 to 150 values and you had to pick each day, your top five that you value the most, your bottom five, and then five that are like, eh. And then at the end of the week, you had like 35 or whatever, and then you would narrow those down. And really you were getting to your top six values. And the concept behind it was to learn what your top values are so you can choose people in your life that have similar values. So in dating or something like that, you can ask questions to others based on your value system and develop concepts and questions and not like an interview or anything, but just things that would align to who you really are. Because at the end of the day, somebody might be really good looking or they might be fun or whatever it may be, but they may not have similar values as you. And so that was crazy. And so I get down to the top five, which I had six because that's me and I couldn't seem to get it to five. And then she was teaching me how to ask questions based on my values. And that was really, really neat. And so as soon as you see different value systems show up, it's not like you have to like throw them out the door, but, you know, just notice, do they have three or four of your top values? Do they only have one of your top values? And there's no judgment in it. It's we're all different. And that's why some of us work better together than others because of your values. So I'll share my values with you. They are spirituality, health, fun, kindness, and caring kind of goes together. Um, authenticity. How many is that? Five or six? I just lost. I didn't write them down or anything. That's just going off the top of my head. Um, and if that's not six, that's five. And that's good. So those matter to me a lot. Uh, you know, integrity, authenticity, is huge for me. Health, because of my health journey is very, very important to me. Having fun, you have to have fun. And to be caring and kind um, slash honest is incredibly important. So I think that's only four. Let me look them up really quick. 
because that would be silly that I can't remember some. Um, so that was was really, really neat because I never I knew what my top values were, but I did not, you know, pay attention to them. Oh, spiritual. I said that. Oh my gosh. And growth. That's my other one. I'm always growing. I mean, I do that so often. I don't even think about it. So spirituality is everybody's faith is different. Um, and that doesn't need to look the same, but there, there needs to be some understanding or openness about the spirituality piece of others. So, and it would be really neat if they have that in their life too. Okay. So that was one of the first things that she taught me. Then she taught me about patterns and taking the data of you. So if you're 47, like myself, you have 47 years of data and not like we're going to create a chart on every thing we've ever done. But when you have enough data, you can start to learn what your patterns are, whether that is in your work or your personal life, your relationships, um, your, you know, health outlook whether you exercise, don't, the patterns that you go into with that. And so it was really, really eye-opening. And so we did mine on relationships on why, because guys, we are the common denominator in our relationships. If you've been dating for one year, three years, five years, eight years, you're the common denominator. If things aren't working out, you cannot go point the finger at the 82 dates you've been on and say, yeah, the dating pool here is terrible <laughs> and whatever. And there's a law of attraction. Maybe you're a mirror and you're supposed to be learning things. There's so many things that go into it. And so I decided like, you know what? I'm old enough. I've been dating for six and a half years, six, whatever it was at the time. I'm the common denominator. And whether it's why I'm attracting a certain person or why I'm showing up a certain way or why, whatever, I'm responsible for my relationships. So... <laughs> So sorry about that. So then I learned my pattern. So up here, you know, you meet somebody and then you have fun and, you know, there's a connection that's made and it goes down the circle. And then at some point there's a trigger and we're not getting into my pattern because that's not what this podcast is essentially about. Someday we can. And when that trigger or that event happens that doesn't work for you, your fight or flight takes off and then you run your pattern. So for me, it was flight. So I would just run. And it was like that song, Ariana, Next, which, you know, she told me one day, why don't you go listen to that song? And so that was eye opening. And so she's like, I just need you to stay and get uncomfortable and start to understand your pattern and why you do what you do. So I did that and learned so much about myself and getting through what the trigger point was where I was like, oh, I'm out of here. And it's all a protection mechanism to keep us safe. But if you keep running the pattern and you keep running your pattern, you're never going to get what you really want. So you have to understand yourself and why do I run the pattern? And there's always an explanation and it's always a subconscious thing usually until it's not. And so learning your pattern of why you do things is incredibly valuable because then you can stop doing those things in your conscious day. And it can show up in your work just as well as your relationships. You know, I was not the best uh, hirer. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I can't even come up with the right words. But anyway, when I would hire employees, I, I could not seem to get that skill down. And so I had hired someone that would help me hire the people, putting the right people in the right seats. At any rate... It, it was huge for me. And then I learned to step back and be like, you are not the one that needs to manage all these people all the time. And that works better. I mean, if I'm, you know, doing that, it just, it, it just, it just doesn't work as well. So, and that's okay. I, I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to do that. So I learned a lot about that. And so, you know, whether I would fire somebody or whatever, I learned so much in how so many different people compile a business and that they don't all need to look like rah, rah at Osteo Strong. <laughs> so that was really neat for me too. And I, I learned a lot and had to be super vulnerable and ask for an employee to come back that I made a huge mistake on. So that was really valuable. And that was just a pattern running itself in a couple areas of my life. So that was really valuable, you guys. And 
different patterns may show up in different things. I think we all generally have one pretty standout pattern, personally. So I learned to get uncomfortable and sit in that. And that was, uh, I grew a lot in that space. Okay, so another thing that she taught me was a thing called the drama triangle. I'm going to try and see if they can put this in the show notes. So this is what it looks like. This is mind blowing. So the drama triangle, I'm going to read some of this on here if I'm not looking at you. It says we move around the triangle until one of us moves out of the triangle into a clear and healthy communication pattern. So in non-healthy relationships and no judgment, we all have had them. So please don't take any of this as judgment. The reason I have this is because I used to be in the drama triangle. So we move around the triangle until we don't, right? Just like everything in life. So the parts of the triangle, we have the bully, we have the victim, and we have the rescuer. So the bully is critical, judgmental, argumentative, uses guilt to control you, bossy, rigid thinking, it's important to be right, dominating, that kind of behavior. The victim feels oppressed, helpless, ashamed, powerless, incapable, dependent on others, is always seeking a rescuer, has a poor me attitude, self-pity, and then avoids responsibility. This can look a lot of different ways. Okay. And then the rescuer savior is overhelpful, an enabler, can be a martyr, feels responsible for others, makes sacrifices for others and discounts their personal needs, sees others as helpless and feels, or I'm sorry, keeps the victim dependent and rescuing creates a sense of being capable. So it's where they can get their value. Now, we don't all fall into the same part of the triangle at any given time. If you're in the triangle, you run all parts at some point in your relationships. So in one relationship, you might be the victim and another, you might slide into bully because somebody else is acting like a victim. So what this can look like is somebody, you know, having a conversation with you or you bring, you know, let's just say a healthy person brings a conversation to the table and is like, you know, this, um, the situation that we were just in, this made me feel however it made the person feel. And if the other person is like, oh my gosh, I can't say anything around you or, you know, I'm walking on eggshells or I don't know what else I can say to you or something like that. When we're just coming with them to our feelings, that is an indirect like victim way. It's just like, oh, I can't do anything right or something like that. We've all heard that from somebody and that's not taking a very responsible stance to the situation. And so Another way that the victim can respond if they're in that, this gives you like a, the old triangle and then how you can be healthy. They can say something like state what, state what you want and need and take action to move forward. Keep your agreements and follow through. Acknowledge your strengths and make note of your progress and appreciate your uniqueness and accept yourself for being you. Ask for support, but not rescuing. So now we could have had a situation where I'm bringing in a bully with a victim. Those two get together often and you got this one, you know, arguing, well, you don't do this and you don't do this. And this one's like, well, I don't know what to do or whatever. You know, that's a, uh, you know, attack right there. And so that one immediately puts that one into helpless. Well, you know, somebody has got to find their way out of the triangle or you're going to keep running the triangle. Well, if we're the bully in some situations and being rigid in your thinking or driven by anger or resentment that we all get angry at some point, a challenger, which is the healthy way to do it, would be communicate assertively, express your thoughts, feelings without being overbearing and set boundaries and be an active listener. Be accountable for yourself. Ask questions instead of ordering or blaming. I am so big on asking open ended questions. So anybody I talk to, they're like, well, what would you do? I was like, I'd ask more questions. I even do that at my Osteo Strong. What is it that they need? You know, what does success look like for them in a situation at Osteo? Like ask more questions that are open-ended, not did you get here? Did you find this place okay? Yes, no. I mean, an open-ended question is like, so how did you feel about that um, event we went to today? Or what did you think of... I don't know. 
what did you think of that game? Or how did you think of the energy at the house we were at or whatever? Open-ended means it can go with so many different ways. And then, you know, it gives the other person the ability to respond to that instead of, you know, saying, I can't believe it went like this. And that person's not very nice. And then all the judgment that slides in. The rescuer, you guys, um, is somebody that kind of over, it's, I don't want to call it like a helicopter parent, parents, you know, not the right thing. Cause you can be a rescuer in any relationship, but we'll just use that for an example, like a helicopter, mom, helicopter, dad, whatever, or someone that's too immersed in somebody's life. So if you, you know, space is really good around people, let people thrive in their space and don't be afraid of space. Now, connect and obviously belong and have all those things, but to rescue people is really only helping the rescuer. It's never helping the person that's being rescued usually. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think. So instead of trying to fix everything for everybody or feel responsible for others, say, I care about you and I know you're capable and be willing to listen to them instead of taking on their problems and pain and be like, offer compassion and support instead of rescue. Like, Hey, why don't you try this? Or have you tried this? Ask open-ended questions and let them hear their own answers instead of trying to fix their problems for you. So in, you know, in parental situations, when one parent isn't, or one child isn't getting along with one parent, and then the kid goes to the other parent, you know, and it's like, oh my God, dad's driving me crazy. And don't try to rescue the relationship and, you know, be like, oh, you should exactly do this and you should exactly do this. The idea behind it is get the child to believe in themselves and be able to stand up for themselves, empower them. Because rescuing them is going to enable them to keep doing the same behavior. And, they're, and then they're going to come to you and at some point, the rescuer gets sick of it. And so empower the people you love to do things for themselves. And that's really what love is. And that comes from a very healthy place. Um, and I think that's really, really important. I think when I was a young mom and my kids were little, I totally, you know, would over, you know, overindulge in everything they were doing. I remember they were playing soccer and they're like eight or nine. And if they're listening to this podcast, they'll be like, yep. I was like the soccer mom that was like, go, go, try harder and all this stuff. Like, what am I doing on the sidelines? And, you know, as they got older and I was like, what am I doing? I, you know, it's like you're feeling something inside you to go to them. And I always think back now. And then I turn to be the quietest mom on the sidelines. And my kids are like, why don't you say anything? I'm like, because I'm just watching you now. And that was so different for them. But I wasn't like the super psycho mom. But, you know, anyway, there was times I was I was a little over the top. And, you know, that's like a bully and a you know, just a mess. We'll just call it a mess. But anyway, I'm sure it fell into the drama triangle. I'll try to get this into the show notes. Okay. The last thing I have is something she taught me today. And it is not the first time I've learned it. I've heard it many, many times, but she said, Jamie, all, you know, print this out, do whatever. Always remember the seven elements of trust by Brene Brown, which is in the acronym braving. And I was like, right, because trusting people doesn't come easy to everybody and it shouldn't. And, and it takes, you know, a long time to learn to trust somebody and how they're going to show up and how you're going to show up. And so I'm going to go through the seven elements of trust. And if anybody wants it, you can get it online, but it's braving. It is the acronym for Brene Brown and her, she has a Ted talk on it, I believe, but the seven elements of trust. So braving again is the acronym B is for boundaries. You respect my boundaries and when you're not clear about what's and when you're not clear about what's okay and not okay, you ask and you're willing to say no. So boundaries, don't overdo for somebody and then be mad about it later because that's a rescue tactic in your triangle and set clear boundaries. If you're willing to be okay spending time helping somebody or whatever, be okay with that. If you're not, then say no. It's okay. Or for anything, it doesn't even have to be help going somewhere or whatever. R in the braving acronym is reliability. You do what you say you'll do consistently. At work, this means staying aware of your competencies and limitations so you don't overpromise and underdeliver. 
in relationships, it's being reliable to that person and do what you say you're going to do consistently. And because that over and over and over creates trust. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If it, you know, you said you could do it and then it turns out you can't, then have that conversation, but don't be that person repeatedly because they're never going to be able to rely on you. So don't overpromise, guys. A is accountability. You own your mistakes, apologize, and make amends. Be accountable. If you did something wrong, be accountable to what that is. If you, you know, broke something of someone's, fix it. Be accountable for what that is. If you hurt their feelings, apologize and be like, you know what, I'm going to work on that. And that will not happen again. And I, I, you know, I didn't mean to make you feel that. Whatever it is, be accountable for how you showed up in whatever that is. Okay. Vault is the V. Vault. You don't share information or experiences that are not yours to share. I need to know that my confidences are kept and you're not sharing with me any information about other people that should be confidential. So my mentor and I used to just call each other and be like, hey, I got vault. And that just meant you couldn't tell anybody anything. And it was such a neat space. And so vault is just when people say things to you that they're trusting you with, hold that in a special container, you know, in a little vault and don't share it with others. They're trusting you to not say anything because it was, you know, private to them, hard for them, whatever it do, it is, it doesn't matter, but you, they trusted to t- you to, they trusted you to be able to tell you. So don't share that information that isn't yours to share. Integrity. You choose courage over comfort. You choose what is right over what is fun, fast, and easy. And you choose to practice your values rather than simply professing them. This is walk the walk, talk the talk. Don't sit there and go on social media and say you're one way, and then you turn off the camera, and then you're another way. That is not integrity. Be who you say you are and do what you say you'll do. I'm really big on mean what you say and say what you mean, and do what you say and say what you do. And don't be something you're not because it's hard to keep that mask on when you don't even know how to play that person anymore. You can only be true to yourself if you're being true to who you really are. And so don't try to pretend. It's to me the dumbest (laughs) dumbest thing ever. Okay. N is non-judgment. I can ask for what I need and you can ask for what you need. We can talk about how we feel without judgment. I am pretty sure most people listening to this podcast have heard sometime in their life, well, that's dumb that you feel that way or something like that. And no, it's not. I feel this way and it might sound silly right now and I might feel like it might be silly later, but that's for me to judge. Right now, I feel like this and it should be a nice, safe place of non-judgment to be able to speak those feelings. Again, at work, friends, relationship, kids, whatever, Having a non-judgmental safe place to talk is huge. And that goes into trust. And the last one in our braving acronym is generosity. You extend the most generous, generous interpretation possible to the intentions, words, and actions of others. Be generous in your, in your giving for whatever that is for you. If it's not authentic to what you can do, then don't be that. So be generous in what that looks like for you. And so it doesn't have to be gifts. It can be actions, words, holding a door. It can be intentional, but be generous in those thoughts. And there's so many things in the world to give like a smile or a hug or a compliment. I really like that skirt or anything. And so be generous in that, but be authentic in it. All right, guys, that is how people learn how to trust others through all those elements of trust. And so when we show up in all the the ways that braving suggests, boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity, then somewhere in there, we learn that we trust you. And I just, I just wanted to hop on today and share these with you. And 30 minutes later, I went through all the things that I wanted. And I hope that something resonated with you that will help you with some relationship in your life. 
And I would love if you guys, since we're being, you know, ask for what you need, I'd love a review on um, Spotify. If you've enjoyed our podcast, just so we can start to get some additional followers, we're starting to get some traction. Please, you know, give us a review on Spotify or Apple so we can get a little traction. Please share this and tell others about it. I'm just here to provide some wisdom that has helped me and that I hope that it helps you. And as always, I'm always here to shift with intention because we are shifting almost every day if we pay attention to what's going on. Love you guys. And thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week. Bye.